Hello everybody and welcome along to this video which is Mr Johnson teaches bayonet charge, so revision for that. This one is from your GCSE English Literature, we are talking about paper 2 in your literature and within paper 2 this is section B and this is where the exam board will give you a printed copy of one of the 15 poems that you've studied along with a question to answer and it's up to you to choose a second poem uh, to answer that question. That second poem will not be printed there, it's only the one that they choose, so you will need to have some knowledge of these poems, which of course is why you're listening to this video right now. So I'm going to talk you through that revision. Um, you will need to be ready to pause this video, adding notes to your copy of the poem, and uh, let's get started. So before we get going, you will need a copy as I mentioned, so if you do not have your anthology at home or a copy with you, you could search for Hughes Bayonet Charge and that should bring you to a website, uh, there are multiple websites with copies of this poem, um, and if you really can't then you can just make notes as we go along. Make sure that you are making notes as you listen to this video, uh, revision is really important if that it's active. Um, if you're just sitting there letting this sort of sound wash over you, then you will forget these things in a few days' time. So make notes, and ideally with a copy of the poem. So if you haven't got one, pause the video now and go and get yourself sorted. And if you're somebody who is sorted, let's move on. So, you will need to read this poem to yourself before we go any further with this video, just so you have it fresh in your head and you're reminding yourself. So, pause this video now and please read that poem to yourself. And I'm presuming you've done that, so have your pen and paper ready and let's get going. So let's talk about Ted Hughes first. You can see from the dates on the top of the screen there, he's a relatively recent poet compared to some of them in the anthology. Um, very well known poet as well, even though he may not be someone you've heard of before, he is um, a very famous English poet. Uh, he was the Poet Laureate between 1984 and 98, as it says there. So he was chosen to be somebody who would write poetry at significant moments in British history. Um, Carol Ann Duffy and Simon Armitage are other examples of Poet Laureates, and they're also in the anthology, as you'll know. Um, his poetry, now this is important, just as a bit of context as well, his poetry really focused on both the beauty of the natural world, but also the violence, um, sort of this contrast that's there, because, I mean, nature is beautiful, but also it's very hard. You've got lots of sort of people, uh, animals being hunted by other animals or being killed, and there's a lot of violence to the side of nature as well, and he really explored that through his poetry, and you can almost see that theme run through Bayonet Charge a little bit as well, where there is natural imagery, but there's also this violence of war over the top of it as well. So worth just jotting those down uh, somewhere on your page. As is thinking about this context as well, so Bayonet Charge is a poem about a soldier um, and Ted Hughes's father served in the First World War. Um, so that's interesting to know already that he has this experience of war. His father would tell him stories of his experiences of the war. His father also survived the war as well, particularly coming very close. There was a bullet which hit the paybook, which is in his front shirt pocket, and the paybook stopped the bullet going into him and killing him. I mean, that is a near-death experience. And again, if you were a child listening to your father tell that story, that's going to have a real impact on you. And in fact, it did, because my next bullet point there says has the quote from Ted Hughes, my first six years shaped everything, talking about his early life and listening to his uh, stories from his father. Um, it's also worth knowing that Ted Hughes served for two years. He was a mechanic in the RAF. Um, that was part of national service, so they had to sign up, and that was in the early 1950s after the Second World War. But uh, Ted Hughes had lots of time, in fact. He was in a very, very isolated, quiet little station working, um, and therefore had lots of time to actually sort of read poetry and read Shakespeare and these sorts of things. So in some ways, his service actually helped him become uh, a stronger poet, you could argue. So let's now think about the title and move on to the poem itself. So, Bayonet Charge. Um, that soldier on the left is holding a bayonet, for those who aren't familiar with that. So it's an attachment that goes on to a rifle particularly. Um, it basically is a form of blade. You could call it almost a knife as well. So it's for close combat. Um, you can't shoot somebody who's running at you and is a few feet in front of you. So actually that's where it would be really useful for that sort of close fought combat. Um, I would say about it, it's a very simple title and a very blunt title. Um, perhaps it's got that military sort of style and tone to it, the fact it just is bayonet charge. And there's no more, so it's not overly descriptive, unlike maybe some poetry titles. So just things for you to consider with that one there as well. 
And before we move into the actual poem itself, just as a summary as well, for those who really aren't too strong with this poem, it basically starts with a soldier in the middle, if I can show you on this here as well, that is the poem itself. Uh, it starts with a soldier in the, in the middle of the battle, straight away. There's no description, we're just in there with him. And it's almost like a few seconds of his experience in the battle. There's chaos going on around him. He's got his bayonet in his hands and he's running towards, uh, towards this hedge, trying to find some, uh, trying to find some shelter while there are bullets, uh, flying all around him. So it really is in the middle of the battle. And while he's there, he sort of has all of these thoughts, almost questioning whether it's worth it and whether the sort of what he's been told about why he should be fighting really matters. And we'll come on to that in a minute. So let's look at the form of this poem. Sometimes I refer to this as structure of the poem as well, but the actual way it's laid down on the page, you can call the form. So look at that. That's the whole poem printed there. It's got regular stanzas, the first thing to notice. So we've almost got it mirroring the regularity of a soldier's life. It's very disciplined. They are given orders. They have day-to-day -day instructions that they have to follow. So in some ways, you could talk about how the structure of that poem or the layout reflects that. Yet, there is no rhyme scheme. And there's lots of enjambment and caesura, which is almost chaos in some ways, where the caesura is the pauses, mid-sentences, where you get a full stop in the middle of a line, which you wouldn't expect in poetry. Enjambment being where it runs on at the ends and spills over. And you've even got stanzas spilling over into the next stanzas as well. So I would suggest to you that reflects almost like the chaos of the battlefield and mirrors that as well. The bit, the fourth bullet point you've got there is in medias res, which basically means it starts in the middle of the action. And think about the effect of that, because it's no good just writing these things and just writing enjambment. You need to be writing down why and explaining to the person reading your work when you write these things, why did the poet choose to do this? So in that case of starting in the middle of the action, it makes us feel like panicked and makes us feel uh, confused as well, because we don't know what's going on. Um, because it started in the middle of the action, as I've said. So uh, let's move on then. That's the structure or the form dealt with. And here is the first stanza then. Suddenly, and that instantly says what I've just been saying to you, we're straight into the action. Suddenly he awoke. We don't know who he is. And was running. Raw in raw seemed hot khaki. Khaki is that greeny brown colour you see on military uniforms. Raw, that repetition of raw. Now, raw can be very painful, but raw also means inexperienced um, as well. So you've got a double meaning going on with the word raw there. His sweat heavy, stumbling. That tells you something about his inexperience, how maybe he's a young soldier, the fact he's stumbling, or the fact he's maybe panicked across a field of clods, which is like mud, towards a green hedge that dazzled with rifle fire. So like the hedge is being hit by bullets as he's running towards it. And this line's really good for violent imagery. He's hearing bullets smacking the belly out of the air, which almost personifies the air. But I'd focus more on the fact that you've got bullets and that verb smacking, which is that really violent verb right there. He lugged a rifle, which you can see actually in the picture I've got there, as numb as a smashed arm. That almost implies the violence, doesn't it? A smashed arm, but also maybe implies that what's going to happen to him in the future as well, that he's going to sustain injuries. The patriotic tear that had brimmed in his eye. Now, patriotic is... I'm going to come on to that later, but that's like the belief in serving your country. This patriotic tear. He's in the middle of a blooming battlefield, and he's actually crying a patriotic tear. Is it really a patriotic tear? I think it's probably more ironic, the sort of poet is pointing out how unimportant patriotism is in the middle of this chaos. Sweating like molten iron from the centre of his chest. Um, sort of... I don't know, would suggest maybe the pain as well, like sweating like molten iron, like literally melted iron from the centre of his chest, the, the emotions that he's feeling in this situation, perhaps you could suggest. There's a lot going on. It's very chaotic, and this poem is one I always tell my students to try not to understand every single line of this poem together. It's trying to be chaotic, so you almost get lines that work on their own, but if you're trying to understand a story from this poem you're going to struggle much more other than a soldier running through a battlefield. And this is just a few seconds of his life captured in this poem. The picture here sort of captures one of the main ideas in this next stanza. In bewilderment, which is like confusion, then he almost stopped, like in the middle of the battlefield, he almost stops. And then this is the big question, making him seem very small. Because it asks, in what cold clockwork of the stars and nations was he the hand pointing that second? 
talking about the soldier almost as in like a clockwork and time and making him like if you look at all those cogs there he seems like a very small cog as part of a much bigger thing that goes on and is he really important the fact that it's cold clockwork cold is almost suggesting like a lack of emotion and it's maybe like the lack of care that those in charge have for the soldiers uh, and how important the soldiers are to them <coughs> excuse me but also the stars and nations Comparing him to stars, stars are like sort of massive suns and really important and are there for millions of years and he isn't. So there's a big metaphor going on with time here, which I think is I really, really like and I really focus on whenever I talk about this poem. Um, I'm going to jump through a few of those lines, actually. He's sort of running, running, running. Uh, and then it sort of, it, this is like a pause. This stanza almost feels like a momentary real stop and thinking about the soldier before then it's almost like pressing port a play again and then you get like the battle start all over again in the last stanza because like there's this moment where it like throws up a hair he sees this dead hair lying there now if we go back to the fact that ted hughes really focus on both the natural world but also the brutality of it that's a really bu brutal image and like real corrupted is the word i would use as well this beautiful animal which is then lying there dead because of what humans have done and the battles between humans except this soldier uh, this hair in the photo is dead but the one in the soul in the poem crawled around in a threshing circle its mouth wide open silent its eyes standing out that's really horrible it's almost like screaming in pain but there is no noise so it's really sort of the corruption of nature that we have caused. And then focus on these last lines as well. The soldier, he plunged past this dead hare his bay with his bayonet towards the green hedge that he mentioned earlier. And then we get a list of th reasons why soldiers were tried to convince to go to war. King, honour, human dignity, these really sort of grand sounding things. But he doesn't even bother finishing the list, etc. Like they're not even important. ETC is what you normally see for etc. That's how it's spelt in full. So almost like he gives up on the list, like he's perhaps given up on his life now as well, or has given up on believing these things. Dropped like luxuries, like things you can't even afford to have, these luxuries, in yelling alarm to get out of that blue crackling air, his terror's touchy dynamite. The dynamite idea, like he's almost become a weapon, but almost his terror's touchy. You've got that strong alliteration going on there as well. And the fact that he's so over-emotional in this situation. We never find out what happens to him. The poem ends there. But again, I come back to the fact that understanding all of this poem is going to be something that might be tricky. Trying to understand bits of the words and bits of the lines which work together, as we've done just now, is probably the best way of approaching this poem patriotism is a real theme that comes up here so the idea of like serving your country and sort of fighting for your country and the strength of that and whether that is actually a true idea or not um i think ted hughes certainly suggests that he has uh doesn't really believe in that idea we've also got like corrupted natural imagery as i suggested to you the effect that humans have on the world and like this battle almost between nature and humans which happens in this poem very briefly you see that with the hair Questions which I'm definitely not going to have time to read through today, but absolutely pause this screen now and have a go at those questions and use them to actually make notes on your poem as well. Try and spot those things. Those are really important questions. But I just want to move on to comparisons quickly. Um, so you could certainly look at this as remains if you want to talk about the effects it has on soldiers. Um, perhaps also compare it with other soldier poems as well. You've got Charge of the Light Brigade where you sort of see the effect that it's had on soldiers. Um, there's multiple connections that you could make really with this poem. Uh, it works really well with other soldier poems, um, but think about the fact it's got the natural world in it as well. There's a question I would like you to have a go at now to that you would be asked to compare this with another poem. For a moment, I'm asking you simply to focus on it on its own and try and unpick it. I'll come up with a question. How does Hughes explore the effects of war? So think about the effects of war and what it does to the soldier. In a moment, you're going to see my attempt. I would get you to focus on the violent imagery. There's a lot of it. And think about how that violent imagery really captures what war does to soldiers so the violence of the words equals the violence of the war. And here, I have definitely not got time to read through this. Do take time and pause this and read that to yourself, though. I would consider that a really good paragraph. I'm quite proud of it, as you would be if you wrote it. But the underlined bits are sentence starters, which will gain you marks. 
particularly the blue, I've named a method. At the end in purple, I've explained the effect and what we're trying to be taught. And in the middle in red, particularly as well, I've got my analysis. I've run out of time today. I hope that you uh, have found this video useful and goodbye.